Father, we thank you for the series we're starting now on marriage for singles. Father, we pray we'll discover more of your love, more of your concern for us as we go through this series in Jesus' name. We pray that you'll we'll touch every life, bless everyone. And even for those who have married, we pray that you'll bless them tremendously and mightily in Jesus' name. See us through as we really go through this series from now on. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today, as we begin the series on marriage for singles, we're going to start by laying a strong foundation for marriage and for the family life. And then later, I'll be considering different aspects of preparation and planning for marriage. And as I said before, along the line, I'll be talking on God's unfailing answers to the marriage situation today. Today, we want to consider God as the matchmaker. That means God as the one that has a plan, a purpose, and a provision for your marriage. And then we might be able to touch on your own preparation. And so, four points on our outline. Number one, God's plan. Number two, God's purpose. Number three, God's provision. Number four, godly preparation. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Those who study the Bible will tell you that the appearance of anything in the Bible, especially the very first time it is mentioned, is very, very crucial, very, very important. And this verse I have read to you is one of the first verses that you have in the Bible concerning the foundation of marriage, the institution of marriage. Let me read it to you and point out something to you that is very, very important for marriage. And the Lord God said, It is not good for the man. First, God said. Second, he was talking about the man. The man to be alone. Next, I, still referring to God, will make him the man and help meet for the man. And so you have right at the foundation of the institution of marriage, the divine human partnership, the necessity of God getting involved in your marriage plan, in your marriage proposals, and in the process and program of your marriage to make it work out very well. Again, remember we studied about God in one of our Sunday fellowships. And I spoke about the eternity of God. That tells you that God had been before man. And when man may not know his need, the God who had been from eternity, from everlasting, he knows the need of man more than he knows. And there God, here God himself looks at man. And he saw the totality of man. And he saw the beginning of man, the life of man. And he looked right to the very end of the life of man. And he said, this man, being alone, will not be able to fulfill everything I want him to fulfill in life if he remains alone. God who knew the end from the beginning. God who knew the task that man ought to perform. He proclaimed and pronounced. That if man remains alone, it will not be good. God saw man and he saw his emotional aspect of life. He saw the physiological aspect of his life. He saw the psychological aspect of his life. He saw the spiritual aspect of his life. He saw the secular, the normal occupational aspect of his life. And he said, there is no way. If this man remains alone, there is no way for him to be fulfilled and satisfied and accomplished if he remains alone. 
then he knew that man will not be able to provide for himself a help suitable for him. And he said, I will make him and help meet for him. That tells you the plan of God. And in verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. Again, you can see that God himself took the initiative and he instituted this plan of marriage. He made the man to sleep. And then he made out the woman for him. In your life, there are many things God does while you are not conscious. There are many preparations and many plans that God himself fulfills while you seemingly are asleep, unconscious, not knowing what God is doing. Because you may not even be able to understand at that time the need of your life. But the God of love and mercy and tenderness will do a lot of things in our lives to prepare us for the future life and to prepare us for the partner that he intends for us. And then he brought the woman to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because he was taken out of man. I'll speak about that later. The point is this, that God, when he instituted and planned marriage, he planned something that will fit into your life, not something that will be opposite or contrary or something that will harm you. And then in verse 24, Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That plan of God that we have read about there took place before the fall of man. It took place at the time when man was in his original purity and perfection. That's very important. That even when man had not sinned, marriage was necessary. So then, that will clear up the point from you. That you might say, maybe it's the fallen nature that makes marriage important. Maybe it is because we are not perfect that makes marriage important. Not at all. In the program of God, the plan came up before the fall of man. Now in Matthew chapter 19, from verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the dead twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, there are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. The point I want you to realize here is this. Sometimes human beings feel that they can improve on God's plan. They feel given time. When civilization develops, we may be able to improve on the original plan of God. 4,000 years had passed since the creation of the world. Civilization had developed even at this time. Empires had risen up. Great men had written a lot of books that Solomon even said, in the study of them is the weariness of the flesh. And many people had lived and died. And man had gathered the experience of thousands of years. And yet, after so many years, 4,000 years of civilization, a question came up concerning marriage. And Jesus still referred to the original plan of God for the people of the world. And he said, don't you know what God did at the beginning? That he made them male and female. 
And that was still the plan of God. And he said, as he made them male and female, he said at that time, and it was still ap applicable at the time of Jesus Christ, that the man, when he's fully developed and matured, when he wants to actually begin life in the real sense of life, and when he wants to begin the purpose of God, the plan of God for his life, for the totality and entirety of his life, he must still live father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, from verse 8. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power covering on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman and all things of God. There are three stages I want you to think about. Stage one, the time of original purity, original perfection, original holiness. No stain of sin in Adam. And God said, even for that man made in the image of God, marriage was necessary. Then 4,000 years later, when the Jews, natural, unregenerate men, just people, natural people, they came to ask Jesus a question. And he still went back to that original plan, the institution of marriage. And now Paul the Apostle addresses a third stage. A third category of people, the church, those who are in the Lord. There are people that might feel, maybe if I am full of the grace of God, marriage will not be necessary. Maybe, if I am full of the Spirit of God, marriage will become redundant. But here Paul the Apostle said for the church, he said in verse 11, Neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. That is, the original plan of God still stands. As long as we are in this world, whether for Adam in original purity, or for the world at large in their nature and their natural existence, or for the people of God in the church who have the grace of God and the Spirit of God, the man isn't complete without the woman. And the woman isn't complete without the man, even in the Lord. In the Lord. That tells us then, that God knew what he was doing and that even today that marriage is peculiar to our life on earth true enough when we get to heaven because that is a different environment that is a different area of life in eternity marriage at that time will no more be necessary but as long as you are here church or the world saint or sinner marriage will be necessary in Matthew chapter 22 verse 30 for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are as the angels of God in heaven when we get to heaven the state of living the state of eternal existence in heaven does not demand marriage or family life. But as long as we're here, it is necessary. Let's look at the provision of God. God has created man as a social being to enjoy the marriage relationship and then to live in families, to rear up children, to live in a local community and to live in a particular nation. In Genesis chapter 2, once again, 
verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh. And so the plan of God is very clear, very definite. But what was his purpose in doing what he did? Because we must understand, God always has a purpose for everything that he does. In particular for such an important thing as marriage. God has a plan and a purpose. Will you notice that God has purpose for humanity at large? When God created this world, the whole world, without thinking of each country, each continent, the whole world, from the beginning to the very end, God had a purpose. And I dare tell you that that ultimate purpose, universal purpose, that enlarged purpose for the whole of creation will not be fulfilled except the marriage plan of God was taken seriously. But then God also has a purpose for each individual, for you and for me. And again, I want to tell you that that purpose and plan of God for you as an individual will not be completely fulfilled except you know God's plan, God's purpose for marriage in particular for you. And so we need to consider very solemnly the purpose of God for humanity and for you in marriage. Let's see again in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. And the Lord God said, the creator, looking at the creature, said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. Think about our parents and us children. When we were born as little children, we didn't know our needs of food of clothing, of shelter, of love. We didn't know the depth of our need. Neither could we explain the depth of our needs. But our parents, because they were older, they knew our needs and they began to supply that need. We as human beings, many times, we do not know our needs. If you have watched your life very critically, you will see that your life is in different aspects. Some people are quite successful materially, but then emotionally, they are not very well fulfilled and satisfied. Some people have controlled emotions, but their temperament, very similar and very near emotions, but still different, their temperament, is not completely satisfied and fulfilled and well regulated. And sometimes intellectually, you'll find that some people are quite satisfied and fulfilled. But spiritually, they are not fulfilled at all. But God, the Creator, haven't created man. And He knew the various aspects of the life of man. He looked at man in its entirety and looked at man in its totality and looking at the emotional aspect of the life of man. Looking at the spiritual aspect of man, the intellectual aspect of man, his personality and spirituality, he saw that that man will never climb to the top of the ladder if he doesn't have a help meet. That's why the Creator said about the creature, this man is not complete yet. It is not good that this man be alone. I therefore will make and help meet for him. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. 
and God blessed them. And God said unto them, Let me stop there and tell you something. I've told you that I'll be simple, I'll be basic, but do not miss the importance of what I'm saying because I'm slow and I'm basic and simple. There are some things you'll never hear from God until you are complete. God speaks to you at your level where you are. That's what we do as children. As parents, rather, we talk to our children depending upon their level. When that child is very small, you talk to them about things that they can understand and things they can do at that level. When they grow up to teenagers, you talk to them and expose to them and reveal to them things that suit that age and that level. When they become totally matured and adults, you talk to them on things they can bear at that time. There were things God never told Adam alone. Perfect, holy, intelligent, and like the image of God, made in the likeness of God, there were things God didn't say to Adam when he was still alone. But now, when he made them male and female, God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. Adam couldn't do that alone. There are things you cannot do alone in the plan of God, in the provision of God. There are things you will struggle and struggle. And with all your resources, that's the plan of God. In all your resources, you will never be able to accomplish that thing alone until there is a help meet suitable for your life. And he said, have dominion over the fish of the sea over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. He spoke to them as male and female. So then, what do we learn of God's purpose in marriage? The reason God has given us marriage as an institution is that your life will be complete. There will be full satisfaction. And then you'll be able to carry out the purpose of God and the assignment of God for your life. The assignment God wanted Adam to carry out, to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish, to subdue the earth, and to have dominion. He couldn't carry out single-handedly. He needed the wife. Then in Psalm 68, the purpose of God in instituting marriage. Psalm 68 verse 6. God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those that are bound with chains. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. What that verse is telling us is that man has two basic problems. There is the one problem of loneliness. There is the other problem of restriction and bondage and in marriage god solves both problems he solves the problem of loneliness he sets the solitary in families then he breaks the bounds he breaks the chains as he brings you into the family maybe you never thought about that that there were many restrictions in your life before you got married but when you got married, it became possible to give expression to all that God had implanted in your heart. You were covered up and restricted and bound in chain, emotionally and physically, and in some psychological areas of your life. And as long as you remain single, there is that restriction all around you. There is that territory around which or beyond which you cannot cross. But in the families, he breaks those chains. Then he says in that verse, that the rebellious, they dwell in a dry land. Those who rebel against the plan of God, against the purpose of God, that they dwell in a land that is dry, unfulfilling. That is, sometimes 
it can become punishment for rebellion when the marriage does not work out very well and the man has to be dwelling in a dry land loneliness in the wilderness in ecclesiastes chapter 4 from verse 9 we're still talking about the purpose of god why did god institute marriage you've seen already that for man to be complete and for the woman to be complete the husband and the wife they need each other to solve the problem of loneliness and restriction or in life man and woman they need the marriage plan of god to be able to fulfill your assignment in life occupational assignment and also the spiritual assignment and this and the dominion that god will want you to have you need the marriage partner let's now look at ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9 two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor for if they fall one will lift up his fellow but woe to him that is alone when he falleth for he has not another to help him up again if two lie together then they have heat but how can one be warm alone and if one prevail against him two shall withstand him and a threefold cord is not quickly broken better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished for out of prison he cometh to reign whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor please listen as i just try to explain to you what the word of god is saying here touching on the purpose of marriage two are better than one before sin came into the world god said two are better than one adam and eve are better than adam alone even after sin came into the world god still spoke to people like noah to people like moses to people like joshua to people like david two are better than one when jesus came and a new dispensation began in that dispensation two were still better than one and in the time of the two are still better than one the bible says one shall chase a thousand but two shall put ten thousand to flight that tells you then according to this passage there are victories you may never win when you fight alone when you face life alone and god has so planned it and worked it out that in marriage you will have a helper in marriage you will have a supporter in marriage well, you will have a help meet that will help you to be able to face life squally and that you will have a good reward for your combined labor then it says if they fall one will lift up his fellow for those who have not got married this will tell you when you look out for marriage that you are not just looking for somebody you are looking for somebody that is of good character you're looking for somebody that is of good discipline you're looking for somebody that is unselfish who will like to help his fellow or her fellow for those of us who have married you see many times because we do not understand how god understands we are married but we're lonely and that loneliness sometimes is of our own making we cut ourselves off from our wives we say she cannot understand but god understands that she can understand and many people they bear their problems alone they do not talk they're too quiet and in their quietness some things are grinding them and some things are almost destroying them don't you understand you are not complete without your wife 
Wife, don't you understand? You mustn't cry alone, bear your problem alone. You are not complete without your husband. So that if you fall, you do not need to hide it from him. He will lift you up. So that if you are discouraged, you do not need to hide it from her. She will lift you up. That's part of the purpose of marriage. Do you know why people today are committing suicide? Many people feel lonely. They feel there is the absence of real and true friend. And because of that absence of true friend, and they are born the burden of life all alone. They hold on to themselves until eventually they feel there is nothing to live for. Many times such problems can be solved if you are married in the plan of God, in the way of God. But at other times there are people that are married. And sometimes a married person may have a mental problem. Do you realize how a mental problem starts? The person begins to say, nobody cares for me. Nobody is concerned about me. And begins to feel that even the husband that is given to be a help me, or the wife that is given to be a help me, begins to suspect that he doesn't love me, she doesn't love me. And this person begins to live in loneliness within the family. And is bottling up the thoughts and the ideas and the imaginations. I will never talk about it. And more and more, that person is becoming more quiet and more quiet and more quiet. And that person is already destroying the very purpose of marriage. Already he begins to build a fence around himself. He doesn't communicate. He doesn't talk. Even he doesn't reach out. He doesn't open up. But that is what we read. That when you are married, he sets the solitary in families. And he breaks the bounds of their chains within marriage. But now he surrounds himself with a chain. And that wife becoming quiet, crying alone, and going apart, and staying in isolation, away from the man, the husband that God had given to her. Eventually, when everything blows up, mental problem may result. Suicide may result. You see, the purpose why God has given us marriage is that you will live long. That no pressure will press you so much to crush your life out. But that your partner, either your husband or your wife, will be able to wipe the tears off your eyes. Will be able to lift the burden off your life. Then it says in verse 13, Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. Never get to the situation where your wife cannot minister to you anymore. Or where your husband cannot minister to you anymore. If you are married, let the purpose of the marriage be fulfilled. Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. From verse 15. And did he not make one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit. And wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. The prophet is referring to what God had said originally. That therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. And so the prophet spoke to the people of God at this time, and said, Didn't God make the two one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit, wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. It is for the reason of what we call procreation. That is, when God said, let every tree bring out after its kind. The way God did that is that the fruit will be planted again. The seed will be planted again in the soil. And then among the fish of the sea, he said, multiply and bring forth after your kind. Again, the fish will multiply after their kind. In the animal kingdom, among the animals, he said the same thing, that they will multiply. When it came to man, it's still the same principle of increasing and multiplying and bringing fruitful. So that a godless seed will cover the face of the earth. So that Adam and Eve will bring forth children. 
The purpose of God is that those children will be godly. They'll be of the godly seed. Unfortunately, there was a fall. And man sinned. And therefore the children were born in sin. And yet, God has made provision that Jesus Christ will cleanse away all our ungodliness. And the original purpose of God in having children that are godly will still be fulfilled and can still be fulfilled in Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Many times we mistake the plan of God for our own plan. Or our own plan for the plan of God. You see, whenever a cult rises up, that cult will strike at the very root of the institution of God. A cult is a religious body that is completely against the plan of God, the purpose of God, the provision of God. And if you examine the cults one by one, you will find that sometimes the cult will say, if you want to have power, if you want to be a real man, if you want to be really strong, do not come near your wife. So that the power of a spirit will be upon your life. And from one cult to the other, that is what they emphasize. But remember that we're talking about the purpose and the plan of God. We who are in the church, unconsciously, even though we do not know about all those cults, unconsciously we get into the ideas of those cults. And it is the devil that brings it up. And in your mind, you'll be saying, even after you are married, that now that you have the grace of God, now that you have the power of God, now that you have the spirit of God, or maybe you are intending to be useful to the Lord in a mighty, mighty way, don't you think that your husband will stand in your way? And as long as you are enjoying the pleasures of marriage, don't you think that you are not going to be spiritually strong? And the man, as long as you are enjoying the pleasures of marriage, don't you think that you will not have power? Don't you think you should give your life completely to fasting so that you'll have power? And if you want that power, forget about wife, forget about husband. Sometimes for those who are not married, that idea may come in your mind. And sometimes for those who are married, that idea may come in your mind. But to see the Corinthian church, the Corinthian church had the gifts of the Spirit. The Corinthian church had the power of God. The Corinthian church was a large, large church. God spoke to Paul. He said, I have much people in this place. It was in the Corinthian church that the signs of apostleship was shown mightily more than any other church. And Paul the apostle said that ye are not behind in any spiritual gift. And yet it was in that church that he said, The Spirit of God in you will not take the place of your wife. The power of God in you will not be a substitute for your husband. And what your wife will do or supply to your physical satisfaction in the body, fasting will never, never supply. You know, I got a letter. And the man was in tears while writing the letter. And from the passion, from the seriousness, from the agony that he expressed in the letter, he was wondering why. The reason is this. He had problem in the body. And he fasted for days. And after he fasted for days, immediately after the fasting, he went into immorality again. And he said, what will I do again? How will I solve my problem again? 
instead of thinking about marriage and looking at God's plan and purpose for marriage, he didn't look that direction. He thought that he will solve the problem of the need of the body by only fasting. But you see, God is a wise God. He has told us to avoid fornication and to live right and to preserve purity in your life, in the family and in society. To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. In verse 3, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife has not power of her own body, but the husband. Likewise also, the husband has not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other. That is, do not cheat one another. Do not withdraw from one another, talking to those who are married. Except it be with consent, mutual agreement for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. But even after you have fasted, if you are married, come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. You see, the Bible shows very clearly the purpose of God. And we need to look at that purpose of God and not to rebel against the purpose of God. From all these that I've read to you from the Word of God, you now can understand marriage is fundamental to the stability and the continuation of society. Marriage breakdown is a breakdown of society until marriage. The priority of our earthly relationship is to our parents. But after marriage, the, parent, the partner's priority is to each other. I've told you already that man is complete only in the unity of marriage. The wife is the fulfillment of the man's incompleteness. The wife is the fulfillment of the man's incompleteness. That means before you are married, you should be looking up to God that God will find a suitable help meet for you. Because only then will you be complete. And you remember what I said originally during this study. There are some things that God will never tell you until you are complete. And then for those of us who are married, as much as possible, let us understand that the husband is the fulfillment of the woman's incompleteness, while the wife is the fulfillment of the man's incompleteness. And you know, it is not in the plan of God for you to be living separately and to enjoy it. There is something abnormal when you as a married man will be living far away from your wife for years or for months, even for weeks, and there is no feeling for that wife. And you say, well, I don't know. I'm even happier when she is not around. I think that I can do more and accomplish more while she's not around. No, I don't think so. Because you cannot be wiser than God. God has said you will do more. You'll overcome more. You will resist more. You will accomplish more. You'll have a greater fulfillment when you are together because you are not complete without him or without her, as the case may be. The objective and the consequence of the marriage relationship is a growing together in unity of the intellects, the emotions, the personality, and the spirituality of the partners. If it is so, we need to consider God's provision. God's provision for your marriage. And I'm talking particularly now to those who have not married yet. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. 
I will make and help meet for him. I know we read it before, but there must be a reason why we're reading it again. God provided for Adam. God himself decided, I will make and help meet for him. The word make is to bring something out of nothing. Is to bring the visible out of the invisible. It is to bring what is known out of the unknown. Now, who can do that? To make something out of nothing. To bring the, invis the visible out of the invisible. And to bring a known thing out of the unknown. That is the area of God's power and God's provision. Sometimes what bothers us today in marriage is that how will I be able to get that visible man, that visible woman out of the invisible? How will I be able to bring something and someone out of nothing? That is the area of God. And it is God himself that makes that provision. And if you understand that God has no problem in doing that, then you will be able to rely on God, that God will give you that provision. Let's look at that example in Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24, verse 7. And the Lord, the Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and spake, which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. It shall send its angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. Please understand. In the case of Adam, the Lord God said, I will make and help meet for him. Here we are now, in the case of Abraham's son. Again, the Lord God of heaven. You see, the emphasis had not changed. The provision of a wife, the provision of a husband, is still coming from the Lord God of heaven. And you need to understand that in your own life as well. It is still the Lord God of heaven that will make that provision for you. I know we studied this passage before in the church, but let me show you something that we're missing out as a church. Now we need to listen so you don't miss it again because we missed it before. Isaac had not married. Abraham, the father, was concerned. And Eliezer, the chief servant, the chief steward of the house of Abraham, was concerned. And looking at the whole chapter, the concern and the prayer and the intercession of Abraham and Eliezer were even more intense and more serious than the desire and the plan of or the prayer of Isaac. It was the father of Isaac here. That called the chief steward of his house, the eldest servant of his house, and he said, Isaac must not make a mistake in marriage. Let's do something about it. Let's find out from God about it. Let's depend on God about it. That the God of heaven will send his angel before you and take a wife for my son Isaac. Listen to me. Marriage is so important for every member of the church. That the pastor cannot just overlook the marriage of the members of the church. And you cannot hide yourself and your need from your father in the Lord. And I must not only teach about marriage, I must pray about your marriage. But obviously, I do not know everybody and I cannot touch the life of everybody. But then we have coordinators. And coordinators and zonal leaders must have such a great concern for the marriage of the people that are not married yet. 
we must not say, well, they have got the teaching. They have known all the steps. And we have made it very clear in the church, all the processes, how to get married. We too must do like Abraham and also the eldest servant. As coordinators, you must be in agreement with the pastor and we must pray. In our families, individually, we must pray for our young people and the single people who have not married. And we must break whatever yoke and whatever hindrance is disturbing them from actually getting married. It is our responsibility and we must pray that God will send his angel and send a spirit before our single people so that God will find for them the people they ought to get married to. Now, single people, let me talk to you. You know, sometimes we make a mistake. I think I understand you. The mistake we make is that we hide our need from our leaders. We hide the need of getting married. The need, the burden we have of wanting to get married, we hide it from the coordinator. We hide it from the zonal leader. We hide it from the woman coordinator. We hide it from the woman representative. We hide from the IFL representative. We hide from all the leaders that God has put over us in the church. I think the reason you do that is because all of us, as leaders, what we have done in the past is only to teach you and to correct you. Maybe some of us pray for you, but you have not seen that we are really concerned and we are really interceding for you. But now a change must come. On the part of our leaders, they must become seriously concerned for the marriage of the single people. And they must pray for them. And those men who are leaders in our church here. Now, leaders, when I say leaders, I mean those who are helping us and leading us and teaching us. You know them in your own district, in your own zone, in your own area, or even in your own house fellowship. The people that you have grown to love, you have grown to respect, and you know by the grace of God, they are real shepherds, and they have the shepherd heart. And you should confide in those people and talk to them about your body and about what you feel. And leaders, let me talk to you. When all these brothers and sisters confide in you, do not gossip, do not talk, or do not criticize them. They, may, they might have made their mistakes. Let's do like Abraham. Let's do like Eliezer. And take their problems to the Lord on our knees. Because their marriages are so very important. And you men, you'll go to the men who are leaders. You women, you'll go to the women who are leaders. The woman coordinator, the women representatives, the women area leaders, and all the other matured women. And you women, whenever these uh, sisters, whenever they talk with you, and they share their body with you on marriage, do like Abraham. Do like the eldest servant. And do not talk about it to your husband. Your husband may be a coordinator. Your husband may be a zonal leader. And me, as a pastor, you may go to my wife. I've already instructed her. She shouldn't talk to me about it. All she should be concerned about, all that the wives of the coordinators should be concerned about, all that the wives of the zonal leaders and the other women who are leading in our various places, all we should be concerned about is praying for our young people that they will not make a mistake in marriage, that God will guide them, that the angel of the Lord will go before them. That's what we're interested in. So, women and men brothers and sisters who are looking up to the lord confide in somebody have interest in somebody who is elderly who is a child of god among these our leaders and let us help you let us pray for you and when i have the opportunity that i'm in touch with your life don't say well it's a pastor is not thinking about that thing well i think about it because it's important for you and I'm not only to preach, I'm also to pray for you. And so Abraham told Eliezer, and he said, The Lord will send his angel before you. And I'm telling you here tonight as well, The Lord will send his angel before you. The Lord will send his spirit before you. Now we cannot cover everything on the outline tonight. I will incorporate what remains in the future outline that I'll prepare in the series that we have. 
And I'm believing God that things are going to change. I'm believing God that the burdens of our hearts are going to be lifted in Jesus' name. And all the mistakes we have made, you might have made a mistake before. Now, area leaders and zonal leaders and coordinators, some of our brothers and sisters will be coming to you. And they'll be revealing the mistakes they made before. Now, if they reveal those mistakes they made before, we're not to abuse them or we're not to criticize them or condemn them. They are telling us so that we can pray for them and so that the mistakes of the past will be completely solved. And I pray that God will help those of us who are leaders and those of us who are single and all of us together as a church that those who are looking up to God and they need to get married, God's plan will be revealed in your personal life. God's purpose will be fulfilled in your personal life. And God's provision will come to you. Let's rise up and pray. Let's love one another, pray for one another, help one another. And if you are looking up to the Lord for a life partner, you pray yourself. You need to pray. And believe in God. God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for your life. And God's provision will be made available to you if you'll pray in faith.